Hi, my name is Edward. I'm an engineer on the PyTorch team and have been working on the project since 2017. Today, I'd like to tell you about the state of PyTorch in 2020. There are four main topics I want to cover today. First and foremost, I want to recognize all of the people who have helped build PyTorch in 2020. Next, I want to contextualize all of the things we have released in PyTorch in 2020, as well as give you a taste for what's coming soon in our Git repository. Finally, I'd like to share some new ways you can get involved with the project. PyTorch would not be where it is today without the support of you, the community. Since 2019, the total number of contributors to PyTorch has grown to over 16,000, up from 12,000 last year. Additionally, there is a huge downstream ecosystem of over 45,000 projects building on top of PyTorch. On the forums, there are 34,000 users talking about PyTorch, up from 22,000 last year. Who are all these contributors? 60% of non-Facebook contributions come from a diverse team of contributors from many companies. These range from teams working on specific components of PyTorch to individuals tasked with generally improving PyTorch as a whole. PyTorch covers a lot of area. CPU, CUDA, Rockham, Onyx, XLA, and Serving are all big topics, and it takes a village to support them all. But that's only 60% of external contributions. Another 40% come from people who don't necessarily work on PyTorch full time. On this slide, I've written down some of the biggest contributors in this category from 2020. If I had to include everyone, they wouldn't fit on this slide. Even if you aren't full time, you can still have a big impact. For example, Dylan Bispalco wrote many of the initial kernels for complex numbers. In his day job, he works on RF semiconductors. Even little patches in aggregate make a huge difference. In fact, 13% of all non-Facebook pull requests came from people who otherwise contributed only once this year. Pull requests on the PyTorch repository only tell half the story. Just as important is the ecosystem of libraries that builds upon PyTorch. We have over 40 official ecosystem projects, most of which are not maintained by Facebook. These libraries and their downstream users have helped make it so that whenever there is a new paper out, there is usually a PyTorch implementation lurking somewhere nearby. All of these things have helped make PyTorch one of the most referenced frameworks in research. And PyTorch is still growing. In 2020, PyTorch was cited in a 4 to 1 ratio at CVPR, a 4 to 1 ratio at ACL, and a 2 to 1 ratio at ICML. So thank you all so much for being on this journey with us. It wouldn't have been possible without you. Backing up a bit, let's talk a bit about what's happened in PyTorch in 2020. In 2020, we made four releases of PyTorch. A lot of the work in these releases has just been the nuts and bolts of small incremental improvements to PyTorch. That's bug fixes, performance improvements, new operators, more supported language features in TorchScript, and more platforms to run PyTorch on. A few highlights. In performance, Xiang Gao sped up the implementation of Max and Min on GPU, making it up to 100x faster on some input sizes. Kushatij Kalambarkar added a new algorithm for multinomial sampling without replacement that can be 100x faster or more. We've added a lot of new operators, many of which were driven by Mike Ruberry's work on improving our compatibility with NumPy. We've also added some complicated but long-requested operators. Piaru Peterson added lob PCG for solving the generalized eigenvalue problem, and Nikit Vedanuj added matrix exponential. In quantization, we've continued to increase the number of operators that support quantization with an eye towards enabling commonly used vision and text models. In TorchScript, we've added support for more Python language features, meaning more and more models can be scripted. In 1.6, TorchScript had enough Python support to script all of FairSeq. In Onyx, we've tracked the new opposite versions 11 and 12 and added support for dozens of new operators. And finally, in platform support, Zhou Zhu submitted an epic patch adding support for distributed on Windows. And of course, PyTorch 1.7 supports CUDA 11. Though, we're probably going to have to do a point release to pick up CUDNN fixes for performance regressions on pre voltage GPUs. There are also some features from these releases. Selective build by Jiakai Liu allows you to compile a version of PyTorch with only the operators your models need, which is important when deploying models on mobile where binary size is at a premium. A new higher level autograd API by Albin Desmazen makes it easier to compute Hessians and Jacobians. Channel's last memory format from Vitaly FedUnion lets you change the physical memory layout of tensors to place channels last, allowing for faster kernels for certain operations. 
we've also started adding inline type annotations to PyTorch, spearheaded by Ralph Gommers, taking advantage of our switch of Python 3 only in 2019. More recently, Michael Carilli has taken automatic mixed precision in tree, allowing transparent speedups in many workloads by converting parameters to lower precision when it is known not to matter numerically. And Anjali Trodia has been leading our work on complex numbers, making it easier to do audio and signal processing in PyTorch. Beyond a list of features, there are three big new areas in PyTorch Core that didn't exist in 2019. First, composability is a new effort to make PyTorch a more extensible framework for library and backend implementers. Hamir Abazi added Torch Function, which makes it possible to easily create custom tensor-like classes and override the behavior of all Python operations in PyTorch. At a lower level, James Reed added support for custom C++ classes, letting you add custom data types that can still be used in TorchScript models. Our general vision is to provide a set of reusable building blocks that library authors can use to extend PyTorch as a framework. Second, distributed RPC is a big effort to make it easier to do distributed model parallel training. Instead of every node in a cluster running the same computation, nodes may run different computations, partitioning up the model that would otherwise be too big to fit on one node. And finally, we announced the general availability of XLA for PyTorch this year. Among other things, this makes it possible to run PyTorch programs on Google TPUs. OK, so that's everything that's released. What's coming soon in our repository? Well, a lot of things. Yuri Zabisky has been working on multi-tensor optimizers, which let us perform a single kernel call to do optimizer updates on multiple parameters, leading to a big performance boost when you have lots of small parameters. Emilio Castillo has moved lazy modules to PyTorch, which are modules that infer the size of parameters automatically based on the shape of the data on the first invocation. James Reed and several others are behind Torch.fx, which is a new framework for doing Python to Python transformations on NN.module instances. Instead of having to write C++ code to do lower level transformations on TorchScript IR, Torch.fx's goal is to write, give you a way to write Python passes on higher level representations of networks, e.g. on the modules. Ivan Kobzarev and Tao Shu have added experimental Vulkan and Metal support, respectively, bringing hardware acceleration to mobile. Richard Zhou has been working on VMAP, letting you conveniently write code that works on single examples and then automatically lift them to batched form. In the compiler space, there's a lot of experimental work going on. NVFuser is an alternative fusion compiler for CUDA developed by a team at NVIDIA. Tensor Expressions and NNC are a TVM and Halide style uh, new backend for fusion compilation that we turned on for, by default in PyTorch 1.7, with the aim of paving the path forward for reductions in dynamic shapes. Taylor Roby added some new tools for making it easier to benchmark code in PyTorch, while accounting for common mistakes that might be made while benchmarking. Finally, I've been working on metatensors, a way to compute the output shapes of operations without actually doing the computation itself. Finally, I'd like to say some words about getting involved in the project. We care a lot about issues and pull requests you, the community, send us. We can't promise that every issue will get fixed or that every pull request will get merged, but we can promise you that someone will at least read each and every one of them. In fact, we have an on-call rotation for the express purpose of sorting through everything you send us. There are a ton of ways to get involved. Even submitting a well-researched bug report with a small reproducer is a great contribution. However, I want to point out three new avenues for involvement that we've booted up this year. First, the RFCs repository is a place for hashing out more complicated proposals that can't fit in a GitHub issue. We're still working out all the procedural process for this repository, but a few new features have already made it into PyTorch proper via this process. Check it out and see if there's anything of interest to you. Second, we've heard from multiple people that it can be quite overwhelming to keep up to date with all the activity happening in PyTorch. To help address this, we are planning to launch a new dev newsletter that will summarize all the happenings all around the PyTorch universe. Stay tuned for this. Finally, Anthony Skopatz has contributed a new tool, Nightly Checkout, that makes it easy to get an up-to-date, pre-built copy of PyTorch that you can do development work on. If you have ever been turned off from contributing Python-only changes to PyTorch because it takes too long to compile and test, check it out. That's it for the state of PyTorch. Thank you for watching, and enjoy the rest of PyTorch Dev Day. Mm -hmm.